Hi everybody, welcome to our Friday Revision session. Thanks for joining in. Really appreciate it on this momentous weekend. A weekend when Newcastle can beat Arsenal to guarantee themselves Champions League place. Uh, we're going to cover financial markets today. Now I know that the financial markets is different in different boards. So what I've tried to do is just focus on some key areas and I invite you to post your brilliant comments as always. So if it's okay with you, I thought we'd spend a few minutes thinking about central banks, about commercial banks, about market failure in financial systems and also a little bit about regulation. I'll finish off with some work on bonds, because I know bonds is something, the bond market is an aspect of financial markets that is particularly important. Along the way, I will try my best to answer questions. So this is an area of the spec, I think, where people do have questions, they want a, a concept explaining. Now, I can explain it. I think that given the quality of the people in our group, in our, stu in our Tutor to you Student Collective, oftentimes uh, students provide even better answers. So let's see how far we go. Uh, I think I've got about 25, 30 minutes uh, with you today and uh, I trialed this out with my students there this morning seems to go well before I crack on with it we've now finished our live events but the online course the online grade booster is a fantastic course it is a stunning course tens of hours of videos and exercises and powerpoints uh, on your course and it's on demand it's available on the tutor tube um, dot, on demand dot tutor tube dot net forward slash students if you need a top up and an extra support ahead of your papers. That course, of course, is live right now. Okay, so as always, if you're joining us live, as many are, uh, take a moment to uh, put, put, uh, register so you can comment in the chat windows, and let's see how we get on. This is a series of one-minute challenges, essentially, and we'll do our best to uh, showcase and uh, give a shout-out to some of the best and interesting answers along the way. Here's my first question for you. Can you give me two roles of the central bank in the UK? Over to you.
Okay, so great answers coming through, and my producer in the studio is picking out some superb ones. So George uh, suggesting that one of the key roles is telling us not to be greedy and ask for money. Uh, I think a reference, a veiled reference to Andrew Bailey's uh, and other NPC members' comments about the need for people to accept a real wage cut during this cost of living crisis. Slightly tone deaf, I think, was that, uh, that comment. It didn't go down too well in my household, that's for sure. Uh, really key point here. I want to make a distinction. I think the crucial point is here's my answers coming through on the screen. If you want to take a screenshot or just jot them down in your notes. I think the key thing is to consider their regulatory um, role and their sort of monetary policy role. So in terms of MP, monetary policy, of course, their job as independent central bank is to set the base rate of interest currently 4.25%. Where do we think it's going to peak? 5% maybe? To meet an inflation target, the government sets the inflation target. Uh, of course, the Bank of England has interpreted the target loosely in recent recent times. They, they felt, last this time last year, they felt the inflation was going to be temporary. Um, transitory was the word they used. That's uh, proved anything but. Just a tiny, tiny point for those of you who are trying to link in topics when we get close to the papers. Uh, the Bank of England, of course, sets interest rates. Um, but it doesn't intervene directly in the exchange rate. It does operate a free-floating exchange rate in theory, but of course we know in practice that changes in interest rates and QE, for example, can have an impact on, on the currency. And quite a few in chat, which is superb, we're talking about lender of last resort, which we are going to talk about today. Bank of England uh, stands ready to act as a lender of last resort uh, to the wider financial system, particularly during a liquidity crisis or a credit crunch or both. Superb. Well, great start. Thank you for those. I'll try and keep an eye out for questions. I've got some really challenging questions. I thought I'd test the collective power of the Tutor Two Student Collective. Can you please give me two possible consequences for financial markets of a large increase in QE by the central bank? Have a go. Yeah, like, I like Sophie's uh, comment, which we flashed up on the screen there, about increased access and affordability of credit. So one of the issues, uh, one of the consequences of QE is that the central bank, of course, is increasing the size of the monetary base by buying government bonds. Uh, that money largely flows to commercial banks. It increases their liquidity. And in theory, that should increase the amount of bank lending. Uh, it doesn't always do that, of course. Here's Bruno. Bruno, one of our regular contributors, comes in with this point. Decreased cost of borrowing has an inverse relationship between the yield and the price of a bond. By the way, big thanks to George for cementing his uh, status as the leading economic historian in the group. And a big shout out to Hugh Dalton, of course, who was a former chancellor, who died many years ago. Here are my two points. I'll just take you through them. This area can get, oh yeah, Jake's point, shift that idea as banks have greater incentive to invest and lend. Yeah. Okay, here are my two points. I'm going to take a little bit of time on this because this is an area where I think explanation really can, can add value for you. Thank you for joining in the session. Um, Lionel, by the way, talks about increasing loanable funds. Banks have more money to lend out, which is a nice, nice point. Uh, QE, of course, is where the central bank buys bonds, typically bonds already issued, by and large. That increases the liquidity of the banking system, should increase lending. Lots of reasons why it doesn't. But critically, it increases the price of bonds. And as Bruno pointed out, as the price of bonds goes up, the yield on the bond goes down. Now, crucially, the yield on 10-year government debt, the yield on a 10-year bond, is taken like benchmark for other interest rates such as mortgage rates and such as corporate bond rates. So if the yield on a government bond goes down, mortgages should become a little cheaper for households. That has a consequence for the mortgage market, which is a financial market. The other one I just wanted to mention, um, <laughs> George is saying that my, his, my shout out is going in this CV. Excellent. 
the other one is really, really important, and it doesn't have to be the UK, by the way. So they might give you a question about QE in another country. Central bank essentially you know, buying bonds. It can cause the currency to depreciate. Can I just explain that for you? Bank of England buys bonds, creates more money in the economy, more money supply. That money might flow to pension funds, commercial banks, and so on. Not all that money stays in the economy. So quite a bit will flow out of the economy in search of higher yields, for example. But if there's a net outflow of money, such as, for example, the United States, when they went for QE, that causes the currency to depreciate. And of course, the currency market is a financial market. So weakness of sterling, in part, has been partly predicated on the, on the size of quantitative easing, which last time I looked, which was about an hour ago, was a total of £890 billion. Pounds. Great answers on that one. Superb. I had a great pleasure and privilege of uh, meeting and chatting to Joe Stiglitz on Tuesday in Oxford. He gave a talk on AI and globalisation and uh, actually stunning talk. It's on YouTube if you want to check out the Oxford Martin School. But I just wanted to show this quote from Stiglitz. I want to talk about a little bit about market failure in financial markets. Stiglitz is like in the financial sector, banks, currencies, bonds, etc., to the brain of the economy, central to the management of risk and the allocation of scarce capital running the payments mechanisms, etc. When it does its functions well, economies do well. But when financial markets fail, it does its job poorly. Economies and societies suffer. And what Stiglitz is arguing there is that financial market failure has externalities. There are social costs. This is why exam boards quite like asking questions on market failure in financial markets. So leading on from that, uh, here is uh, a new challenge for you. 60 second challenge. I'm going to uh, show you in a second six. Well, actually, let's bring them up now. Here are six types of financial uh, market failure on the left hand side, six numbers and explanations on the right hand side. So we're looking for combinations of letters and numbers. Can you get all six right in a minute? Let's find out. Post the answers in chat. There we go, change of music as well for this one. Uh, quite a few people came with some great answers. I think Harris might have done really well on this. Let's just quickly check on the answers, how they come through. So moral hazard, I heard the answers coming through. Moral hazard is when you take more risk than you should. If you're, if you're insured against risk, that's really quite important. So bailouts can create moral hazard. Asymmetric information, of course, there's that imbalance of information between buyers and sellers. Market rigging is using monopoly power to fix prices above competitive levels. Speculative bubble is when the price of an asset is way above where it would normally be. Speculation is when people anticipate price changes. And F6 is in the right position already. It's when one person makes decisions on behalf of another. A really good example there was um, the global financial crisis. Uh, I mean, there's a truly brilliant book by Gillian Tett on this, on this topic. Uh, financial markets were so complex, so, so much happening. Uh, that the shareholders in most financial corporations just didn't have a clue what was happening. Certainly didn't understand what uh, the derivatives managers were doing, selling subprime debt, for example. Uh, okay, let's have a look at the next question for you. Moving on, this is can do with market failure. Northern Rock, a business that I had shares in. Well, I still have shares in. They're just not worth anything anymore. And Northern Rock, of course, uh, there have been some more recent failures of banks, including SVB and what have you, and Credit Suisse. Uh, but... Um, Northern Rock failed as a bank in 2007. There was a run on the bank, nationalized in 2008, split into a good and a bad bank. Eventually, Virgin Money bought Northern Rock, um, a nice way in for the uh, to Branson's financial service business. But this is a really good example of a bank that uh, was ultimately a failure, started off doing really well. Um, 
how it says unlucky Jeff should have shorted them. Well, I, you know, I was, a, I was, a, and this was 1997. Sorry, it's 2007. It was a long time ago. I didn't understand shorting them. Uh, Jeff said, uh, Aaron says, do you think there'll be any questions on the SVB and First Republic bank crisis? No, clearly the exam was set a year ago. But of course, you can always bring in recent examples as part of a 25 marker. Show the examiners that you bang on it. Here's my question. I've got several questions relating to this banking failure and financial market failure. Can you give me two reasons, please, why commercial banks such as Northern Rock do fail and can fail? Here's Jay's answer, and one of many excellent ones, insolvency, which arises from inability to pay back defaulted loans. Excellent. Alternately, they have a liquidity crisis and cannot pay back their depositors, people who've saved money with the bank. Uh, Rax talks about lack of regulation, such as not enough stress testing and reserve requirements. Wow, that is a superb answer. And here's Chloe's answer, moral hazard, causing subprime lending and risky decisions that cause liabilities to exceed assets. That is an absolutely top answer. Ewan talks about low cash to illiquid asset ratios, banks maybe becoming too leveraged, they, they, they created too many loans relative to their, uh, to their deposits. Uh, some really, um, some fantastic answers. Jake Heppenstall, one of our regulars, one of our superb contributors, faulty economics models that allow leverage ratios to go higher relative to liquidity. As a result, firms overspend, presumably banks, uh, overextend themselves. However, this is now more regulated it is. I could go into the detail, Jake, about leverage ratios at businesses like uh, Lehman Brothers, but uh, ordinarily you'd want a leverage ratio of about five, and Lehman Brothers was six times that. So only if you have a leverage of 30, for those who are technically minded, it only takes 3% of loans to go bad and you're wiped out, basically. Lionel Messi, great to have a, a, an iconic footballer in the, in the group, talks about depositors panic and withdraw the money, which creates a liquidity crisis. Fantastic answer. All good. Here are my two Penny's worth, uh, banks such as Northern Rock. So I'm getting a bit emotional. Those shares I still have are, are worth nothing. I, I would just call it loss at two L's, losses and liquidity. So if people default on loans, the bank will suffer losses. Those losses erode the bank's capital, and that reduces their ability to lend. And often the investors decide they're not willing to cover those losses. That certainly happened with uh, Silicon Valley Bank and uh, Credit Suisse, which I think has now been renamed Debit Suisse. There we go. Um, liquidity for banks is a sudden loss of confidence. They may struggle to obtain fresh funding in the interbank market. The credit crunch, they face liquidity problems, and that causes a run on the bank. Interestingly, Ollie says, what are leverage ratios? Fantastic question. Ollie, a leverage ratio in financial markets is the ratio of the amount you've lent out to the assets you have, or the cash liquid assets you have at a bank. So if let's say you've got 100 million pounds of uh, liquid assets that you can call on in the crisis, but you've leveraged, you've lent out 30 times that. So the top is 30 times higher than the bottom. It only takes 3% of the top to go bad and it pretty much wipes out what you've got underneath the uh, the line there. So I hope that explains it. It's le highly leveraged. Here's George coming back in. George uh, saying those Northern Rock shares became Northern Pebbles. Uh, George is both a poet as well as an economic historian of some note. Okay, link to that. Let's move on. Great point, by the way. Loving today. Uh, this is a tough one. I asked my students this this morning, actually. I got a fantastic answer, by the way, so I want to share with you. In the context of financial markets, what do we think is meant by systemic risk? Have a go.
Wow. Okay. Wowza. I actually thought that asking this question, very few people would be answering it. I seriously mean that. And I think Temi had a great, lovely little uh, uh, succinct answer, which absolutely, absolutely smashed it. Um, Aaron talks about when one bag fails, another can fail, creating a domino effect, perhaps a link there to SVB and now First Republic. Totally. The fragility of the US banking system at the moment is something that the FT is writing about and others are writing about. So that, that, that exactly right. Can I give you my definition? Those of you watching the live stream, of course, that, just keep an eye on the live chat. This is staggeringly good. So the context uh, is basically when the failure of a single institution, it doesn't have to be a bank, by the way, but the systemic risk is a superb concept to bring into your 25 markers, if, if that's what the board will require. The failure of one institution, a pension fund, perhaps, in the wake of the quasi Quartang budget back in September, uh, an insurance company, uh, a bank, obviously, one institution can lead to a contagion or domino effect that spreads way across the financial system and beyond threatening the stability of the financial system and also um, a wider crisis. Really important. And that's why financial regulation is, um, is significant as a student. Make sure you're keen on, you're good on financial regulation. Golden Panther says, what is a contagion effect? Uh, well, if I, if I tell you a great joke, Golden Panther, you'll start sharing it with others. That's the contagion effect. So uh, one, uh, the domino effect, of, we live in an interlinked, complex, interdependent world. So it's often said, for example, butterfly theory, if a butterfly flaps its wings in one part of the world, it might create a, a hurricane somewhere else. Um, chain events. So one big event can trigger a whole chain of events. Next question coming up. We're in grid form here. Let's crack on. Now, this is important. Can you give me two possible consequences for the economy of bank failures? Okay, again, following, following clear. Sean, great point there. Unable to facilitate savings, the savings ratio reduces, lack of investment in the economy. Sean asked a question, I think, uh, what is a counter-cyclical capital buffer stock? The idea there is that during the good times, during a boom, banks are expected to um, the buffer stock. They're required to build more capital up uh, so that when the recession comes, Sean, banks have enough capital. They can, be, they can bring down their capital reserves maybe when... But bad, bad loans are going up. Great answer from Felix. And you contributed today. A loss of jobs as a financial sector is a huge source of employment. It is. Well over 1.7 million people in the UK currently work in financial services. Also, really good point from Felix. Terrific point. Bigger deficit on the current account as finance is one of the UK's biggest exports, which indeed it is. Some great points there. Ollie talks about negative wealth effects caused by decreased supply and demand for mortgages. Maybe a fall in house prices. Yeah. Uh, this causes homeowners to spend less due to the behavioural influence of lower asset values. Yeah, lots of people talking about stock markets and housing markets, possible capital flight, for example. But the reason for asking this question, by the way, it could be a synoptic question. So the failure of a bank is a micro point, isn't it? But it could have a macro consequence. As I've said before, macroeconomics has micro foundations. Here are my two points. Uh, credit crunch. I think quite a few people in the chat were saying this. Banks would, uh, well, there's less money to lend out. So businesses and households find it hard to obtain loans. And that in turn, nice little connective, leads to a decline in investment and consumption. You can't get a mortgage, for example, kind of a business loan. And that leads to weaker growth. By the way, I really like the Felix point about the trade balance. I'm going to add that to my own notes. And a fiscal effect. If governments are being bailed out by bank, uh, by uh, if banks are being bailed out by governments, we'll come to that in a second, that leads to increased fiscal deficit, higher national debt. That drives interest rates up on bonds. And eventually we all pay higher taxes. Survey tells us that a banker's favourite packet of crisps is a credit crunch. 
Yeah, but, but capital flights. Capital flight is when people, investors, uh, seek to move their money out of a country, out of a country. Um, George says that my jokes actually are an example of negative externalities, and that's a missing market. George, I don't want to take issue with you because obviously we've had issues in the past, but it's a partial market failure. It's not a, it's not a missing market. But anyway, thanks for coming, George. That was a great point. Um, oh, okay, cool. Rosetta says, hi, guys. Choir just finished. Rosetta, one of our great contributors, I just I ran. Can we please give a big shout out to Rosetta Golder, who's one of our great, great contributors. Uh, Alan talks about brain drain with money. I did a video on, what was it the other day? I did a video on Sri Lanka. Very interesting with the collapse of the financial system in Sri Lanka as well as the economy. They are losing software engineers, bankers, surgeons, teachers. 300,000 people have left Sri Lanka in the last year. Okay, let's crack on. Got some other questions. I'm conscious of time. We should be finished by midnight. That's the plan. Now, this is superb. Can you please give me one argument for bailing out a bank that fails? And if you have time, an argument for letting banks go under. Have a go. Wow, Harris's point, I mean, one of many, but we decided to uh, showcase this one. It prevents systemic risk, lovely use of that concept. However, it then sets a precedent for future banks, banks coming in years to come, who may suffer from moral hazard. The best option is conditional bailouts. Yeah, um, superb answer there. TS, systemic, systemic risk, stop it spreading to the rest of the financial system. And quite a few of you, including John Smith, were saying that's a very Keynesian, almost Stiglitz-esque approach. There are significant externalities from letting banks fail. Equally, um, bailouts are expensive. They add to debt and may well be basically socialising, loss-making, reflective of poor banking practices and shouldn't be operating anyway. I'm, I'm reading, I'm trying to keep an eye on, on them, <laughs> trying to keep an eye on the, on the comments in the chat. They're just amazing. I just, I'm so in awe of some of the comments here. Arhan talks about the argument for bailing out is systemic risk. I think it is. If the JP Morgans of this world went under, the Goldman Sachs would follow. Probably, although Goldman Sachs have a track record for just managing to avoid the worst case scenarios for some reason. Uh, yeah, George, that's a great question. Is the failure of a bank a negative externality in production? What would you draw here? That is a terrific question. I wouldn't necessarily draw a diagram here, George, but I'd try and build externalities into my answer, which I'll probably explain to you in, in actually as we go through my answer now. Here it comes. Uh, here are my points, just on this one. Four, yes, wow, we, we, we're we thinking like a bailout can limit wider systemic risk. By the way, just adding the word wider, so it just feels right. It can mitigate the negative consequences for the real economy. When you have financial failure, just look at what's happened in Greece and in Sri Lanka and in Turkey and in other countries. People suffer, okay? Prices go up, prices of vaccines go up, good businesses can't get loans. We all pay higher taxes. Financial market failure has negative externalities. There are, if you want a phrase for your notes, there are external costs from a failure of financial markets. Um, and uh, yeah, George used it you, in the chat. George used the Schumpeterian idea of creative destruction. So yes, you want to prevent moral hazard, but actually also, if you let banks fail, new banks emerge. We'll all be carrying Revolu and Monzo cards in the years to come. With new models, new banking, uh, Objectives, and, and that's a kind of very Austrian view compared to the uh, to the other one. Uh, yeah, a lot of banks are too big to fail. Oh yeah, so uh, Riti says, Riti says, hi Jeff, thank you. What's creative destruction? This is an idea from Joseph Schumpeter, which says that um, if you allow, as businesses die and disappear, as fail, 
new businesses, new ideas emerge. Uh, if you want a phrase, um, necessity is the mother of invention. So um, I think I, I don't have a Monzo card. Who has a Monzo card or a Revolut card? Apparently they're superb um, and really, really popular. Uh, Esther says, is the purchase of Credit Suisse from UBS a kind of bailout? Well, it, effectively it was. I think the Swiss government nudged, <laughs> nudged uh, UBS into buying Credit Suisse. I don't think it was optional, really. Uh, JP Morgan probably made their own decisions when it came to, to buying that bank uh, the other day. Let's crack on, because uh, I'm conscious of time. that Your time is valuable. Quick one. This is important. This is important. Can you please distinguish between credit risk and liquidity risks? AQA students especially have a go on this one. <laughs> uh, the answers are coming through don't worry george the answers are coming through ollie's here liquidity risk is where banks don't have su sufficient liquid assets to meet their liabilities and i think malika had a really terrific definition of um of uh, credit risk uh, well there's not a message for you as you'd expect lot of us understands credit and risk but banks, pe uh, people default on loans. Here it comes, Malachi. Thank you for this answer. Terrific answer. Credit risk is you've lent too much out. Liquidity risk caused by run on people's run on the bank. Yeah, credit risk. Let me show you my answers here. Uh, essentially, Jay's going to write. You, you, you're over leveraged. You've basically lent out to people who are perhaps got a poor credit history. So credit risk is the risk the borrower will fail to repay their debts. They default on the debts. It becomes a bad debt, and you have to write it off in your accounts. <laughs> Servid Jameson says liquidity risk is a Saturday night Indian. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I'm looking forward to having a, a kebab later on to this evening. Beth says it's on the edX spell spec. Yes, it is actually. I think you just need to these concepts like systemic risk and risk are all important because financial markets are basically markets in risk and information. Now often they get banks get things wrong, insurance companies get things wrong. So stick with it, Beth. Hopefully this will be useful. This is our next question. By the way, if you, if you want, if anybody wants me to order some you know, Nando's or whatever, just let me know in the chat window what you'd like me to order, and we'll organise it for you on the two, two account. This is super important: financial regulation. So, whilst we're ordering, can we? And this is really important for all boards. Can you please give me two ways in which financial regulators can reduce the risk of, for example, a commercial bank failure? Over to you. Jake's point. Uh, Jake's making a point forcefully there. Do not let banks use their own financial math models. Allow them to set their own leverage ratios. N increase monitoring of net capital rules. I think that's certainly the case. Uh, and that's the job of the Bank of England, the Financial Policy Committee, to, to scrutinise the financial system much better. Lots of you talk about stress tests, which I love. Uh, capital ratio, liquidity ratio. Capital ratio is basically technical. 
uh, yuan, but capital ratio is a, a wider range of assets. Uh, whereas liquidity ratio is very liquid assets relative to the bank's lending. So liquidity is basically the cash, the money at the Bank of England, etc. Harris talks about credit risk nudging consumers. What a bit of behavior. I wonder if Harris is a, uh, an AQA student, perhaps, nudging consumers to check their credit scores to prevent high interest rates from payable loans. Wow. Some of you mentioning there that firewall between commercial investment banks. Yes, yeah, splitting, splitting uh, the bank. Really good. Uh, increased liquidity and capital ratios, a cap on bonuses. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. The extent to which managerial driven decisions such as the Northern Rock caused, uh, caused the, the, the bank to come a cropper. Wow, the risk reading through, there's some absolutely fantastic answers. And here's Ollie with half chicken blends, garlic bread and chips with Perinase fellow. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's when I've got 40 chicken wings, buffalo chicken, and I think we've got some, uh, for George, I think we've got some lime and herb. A hummus and chili drizzle. Looking good. Here are my answers just while we um, digest that news. Really, really important. This is super important. Uh, prudential regulation is just where the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England can now impose requirements on banks to maintain enough capital to absorb potential losses. And I think we talked about that could be counter cyclical. So during a boom time, banks are required to increase their capital reserves so that when the economy goes into the downspin, they can use up, it's a little bit like a buffer stock in many ways. Use of stress tests, super important. Stress test is the 18th of May, it's paper one. No, a stress test is actually uh, where the Bank of England runs, gets all the, the data on the banks, and they run the bank accounts, like Barclays, through a whole series of scenarios. What happens if house prices fall 50%? What happens if uh, unemployment rises from five to 10%? What happens if there's a major bank failure somewhere? To see if banks can withstand tough times. That's what a stress test is. Uh, Arhan says, medium with extra hot and use it on the side. This is adding up, by the way, as, as Jim was pointing out, we are going to be using the, the Northern Rock, um, the, the new Northern Rock credit card, which is terrific. Uh, direct interventions, can I make a really serious point here? Uh, the Bank of England has now introduced occasionally a maximum loan to valuation ratio in the mortgage market. So they might say, for example, you're trying to buy a £400,000 house. Uh, when it was Northern Rock, they would have lent you £500,000, a loan to valuation ratio of 125%. Now, mortgage lenders uh, have cannot lend you the full amount of the house. The loan to valuation ratio is lower than 100%. That just helps limit what they're prepared to lend you and increasing the cash to deposits ratio. I think you're, you're bang on it as a group. Um, I think there will be a, a video on financial market regulation. If there isn't, I'll update it over the weekend for you. So we've got some key key points there. Golden Panther, butterfly chicken burger with peri peri chips, please, will really help me, really help me focus on my revision. I, I agree, actually. I agree. Did I tell you the first person I ever taught is now CEO of Nando's? What a, what a, what a career. Next question. Almost there. A couple of things to finish with. Let's finish with bonds. So you've done brilliantly. I just want to spend a bit of time on bonds. I know it's on AQA. Uh, oh, George says, Jeff, I said it as a joke, but in all seriousness, would nationalizing all banks be an option to reduce systemic risk? This is really interesting, George. I have taught privatization and nationalization to my other students this, this year, and I haven't really asked them a question whether they should nationalize the banking system. I've asked them questions about water and telecoms and rail and what have you, energy. Wow, it might be worth us thinking as a collective whether we should nationalize the banks because of course then but the point i would make there george it's a great question by the way the point i would make there is you don't necessarily need to change the ownership of a bank to regulate it if the regulation is right and it's the, you get the right architecture then really the ownership doesn't fundamentally matter because you can have an inefficient government banks as well uh, jacob mentions the bank of dave now i haven't yet seen that film i'm told and it's a brilliant film i think it's on netflix isn't it it's is a superb film and it must must be watched here we go uh, let's think about bonds bonds issued of course to issue fund government borrowing corporates issue bonds but it's many government bonds they pay a fixed interest called the coupon the fixed interest uh, most have a fixed maturity date apart from a boris johnson bond don't know if you've heard of that. I don't know if it's on the Excel spec or the AQA spec, but a Boris Johnson bond never matures. But either way, 
uh, you issue a bond, you pay the interest each year. The price of the bond can vary because once it's been issued, the price goes up and down in the market like a share. So therefore, the yield on a bond is the interest divided by the market price of the bond. Now, this is where the examiners will set calculation questions. So if the coupon is £1,000, if you hold the bond, you get £1,000 per year. The market price is £20,000. Well, 1000 over 20000 is 5%. So the yield is 5%. By the way, in case people are asking, a lot of people are now searching on ChatGPT for Boris Johnson bonds. They're not yet issued, okay? They don't, they don't exist. It's just it, it just never matures. Here's a question. Here's a calculation question coming up. And then I've got one more question, I think, for you. The yield in a bond, if the bond's market price falls to £14,000, can you calculate, please, the new yield, post it in chat, and give your answer to 1DP. Have a go, please. Ben says you've got no clue how to calculate it, but I'll guess 7.1%. It's my lucky number. How many people have 7.1 as their lucky number, Ben? You're probably the only person in the world that has 7.1 as your lucky number. It is indeed the correct answer. So the, don't forget, the, the coupon stays the same. A lot of people have to watch the coupon. The coupon basically is the amount of money you get each year, £1,000 in this case, if you own the bond on a given day, like May the 4th or May the 5th. If you own the bond, you get the coupon. So the interest doesn't change. That's why it's called fixed interest security right the interest doesn't change the market price can go up and down like the price of google shares okay so 1000 divided by the price gives you the yield okay uh harris says um, he's a further mathematician and he sometimes mess up these questions well indeed i was some of the best people i've ever taught uh struggle with these kind of questions also a comparative advantage for some reason anyway 7.1 percent to one decimal place the answer is 7.14 but it was asked for uh one decimal place. Sean says, what's the yield on government debt at the moment? I think it's about 3.7524%, I think. I think. Now, just very quickly, the Riddler came in with 7.1%. Great to see him up in here. Uh, George, a poet, our poet and historian. I know a guy who only speaks in financial market terms. His word is his bond. And George also said that the name is bond, government bond. Thank you, George. Um, and uh, we've been expecting that comment for some time. Nice chat for oh, Thank you for that super chat. We really appreciate it. Now, I've got two more questions to finish with. Two more questions. Now, these are hard, right? Okay. By the way, I'm still waiting for the orders. Whatever comes in in the chat in terms of orders will, will be ordered, and you'll be able to pick them up uh, directly from Screen 6, Westfield, in about half an hour. Here's a chart showing the yield. Now, this is really interesting. This chart shows the yield on 10-year government bonds. I've just chosen a selection of countries. I've chosen nine countries, Greece all the way down to Japan. Here's my question. Uh, using this data, uh, can you give me two economic reasons why yields vary between countries? This is our penultimate question today. Please have a go.
Yeah, some great answers coming through. So thank you again for them. Uh, now, I, I, I kind of chose these countries kind of deliberately because Greece is at the top there, 3.35%. And obviously, Japan is way low, 0.24%. So Japan has a huge government debt, but the, the yield on the debt's tiny, really. Here's Malachi's point. It depends on the amount of national debt. The higher the national debt, the less people will want to borrow as they have left confidence. So possibly, possibly. Matt and others talking about uncertainty in the government, a risk of default. Joseph, Raphael, talks about it depends on the levels of inflation, which also changes interest rates. Lovely point. Really good point. Um, yeah, really good. Um, ah, Marcus Flynn talks about it depends on different countries' inflation rates and different credit rates. Just on that chart, before I show the answers uh, coming up on the screen, keep in mind that well, that figure for Greece is really low. It's really low. Greece is now borrowing um, for 10 years at less than 4%. Go back 10 years, financial crisis, it was, I don't know, 20%. Of course, if you take off inflation, uh, Greece can probably borrow at negative real interest rates. So these, there's quite a big gap there between the two the, the countries, but other countries, particularly developing nations, way higher. Just did a video a couple of days ago on Sri Lanka, the context video, and their yield is now 35%. Argentina, 40%. Um, Zambia, 30%. Beth, that's a great question. What's considered a good yield? Well, it depends on the economy, Beth. If you're a high-income country, uh, your yield, in theory, should be somewhere between 2 and 4%. It does depend on how long you borrow for. Here are my two answers coming up on the screen for you. Uh, inflation risk, quite a few came up with these great points. Uh, countries with higher and actual expected inflation will expect higher bond yields to compensate. So investors, often in, uh, international investors, of course, will need a, 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 will charge a risk premium if they think inflation is going to eat into the real value of the bond over 10 years. And default risk. So those countries with big debts, big deficits, often are at greater risk of defaulting. Uh, by the way, here's a here's a question for you. I posted the answer in chat. When was the last century, the last century, when the UK missed a debt repayment on on its debt? What do we think? Uh, so the default risk is super important for many countries. And uh, interestingly, Ghana, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Turkey have all defaulted recently. Um, what caused Greek's debt crisis? Well, Greece was uh, highly exposed to the global financial crisis, legacy of government failure, very low tax returns, the share of GDP. Ah, Young G says 1700. Uh, Jacob said the 21st century. Rosetta says never. And Rosetta's right. In that, uh, Rosetta, Rosetta, the UK has never missed a single repayment on its national debt. Arnold says, Jeff, Japan has a lot of fiscal debt, but why does it have a low yield? Well, the reason is, uh, great question, by the way, Lionel. Um, and by the way, keep going when you leave Paris. Uh, Japan has deflation. So uh, investors, the inflation risk, of course, is pretty much zero, isn't it? And a lot of the debt that Japan issues, the bulk of the debt, is issued to Japanese investors, pension funds, households. So Japan doesn't have to offer a high yield to foreign investors because some... Um, most of the debt, the vast majority of the debt remains within Japan. Uh, okay, so yeah, um, Rosetta is right. Never missed a repayment. Last question coming up. It genuinely is the last question. So have a go at this one. This is, by the way, there's the UK yield. Uh, you might get a yield chart for the UK. Uh, yields were falling during the pandemic. They were, they were less than 1% in 2020, 2021. Wow. UK government could borrow money for 10 years at less than 1%. I wish students could borrow money for 10 years at less than 1%. I wish students you could borrow money at that rate. But look what happened in 2022. Inflation rising, and then the yield shot up in the September of 2022. I'm not sure what happened there. It must have been some sort of dodgy budget, perhaps. It's currently around 4%. Okay, here's my last question. Yeah, George says, I wonder why I'm in autumn. Well, I think we know what happened, George. Give me two reasons, two likely effects sorry, of a rise in bond yields on government debt for countries such as the UK. Over to you, last question. Have a go.
Yeah, there's your own point. Debt interest payments represent an opportunity cost. Matt Campbell had a lovely answer talking about an increase in debt servicing costs. Yeah, the budget deficit uh, is about through the billions. I think that uh, the figure I've got, Matt, is that this year the UK government, if you want to jot it down, is going to pay £102 billion in debt interest. Two billion pounds a week just paying the interest. And here's Bruno. What, what a session without Bruno is like it's like uh, chicken wings without the, the lime and herb sauce, really. Increased cost of borrowing for the government increases their debt servicing costs as they finance their budget deficit, further perpetuating the deficit. You can get caught in a debt trap. Sophie's lovely answer from Sophie coming up there about an increase in. Can we find Sophie's answer and put it up on the screen? That read beautifully, read really well. Here it comes. Increasing government debt can lead to a reduction in government spending. I'd add in there, Sophie, real government spending. Just adding that word, because they aren't to cut back in real terms, and thus large opportunity costs, likely of contractionary fiscal policy to help the debt. Now, what you, the only way I could improve that, apart from putting the word real in, is giving me an example of what the government might have to spend less on. Housing, healthcare, education, whatever it is. Make it, make it as, to get that such as seasoning. Um, absolutely superb. Here's my point. Debt service costs, yep. Um, so, for example, I think I've added that, haven't I? that might reduce the financial resources available for spending on education, NHS, and other priority areas. And crucially, this is an interesting point, that the bond yield goes up, actually it becomes more attractive to buy UK government debt. So you might get some overseas investors putting some hot money into UK government debt, which could cause the currency to appreciate, which would then help to control inflation, but export sectors would take a hit. Carl says, what's the debt trap? Debt trap is basically where the government has got such a high level of debt and a high cost of servicing debt that sometimes it has to borrow the money just to pay the interest. George brings us into sort of modern monetary theory, which I won't cover here. Hey, look, everybody, we've done 50 minutes. Wow. Uh, I thought we'd do a well, slightly longer session because obviously it's a big, big topic. I'm very conscious that there's a different coverage of financial economics between boards. So there might have been a little bit of overlap for some and less so for others. What I'll do over the weekend, by the way, is I'm going to tidy up our playlist on financial economics. Uh, oh, breaking news. Bad news from Chile. Well, that's, a, that's really bad news. Northern Pebbles credit card. Oh, no. Uh, okay, I'll try to follow that, boys, and everybody in a few minutes. But I'm going to look through our playlist on financial markets, make sure it's in, in the right order, and just maybe do a few tidy up videos so you can bring back up to speed in 2022. This is an area that hasn't really been tested much across the specs and courses in recent times. I quite like that question that George raised about should banks be nationalised? I'm going to give that some thought over the weekend. So I might even do a video when the king's putting his crown on his head, or somebody else is putting the crown on the king's head, obviously it's quite heavy. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking, think out to next week. If you wanted me to do any particular sessions on something, we did quite a few over Easter, we did nine, we did government intervention on Monday. If you want to post in the chat window some topics you might want me to cover, we are kicking off Johnny and the team are doing our live streams on Wednesdays next week, but we can do lots of other sessions next week as well. If you maybe post in the chat window, uh, what times of the day are you on study leave? Can we do some, can we do some sessions a little earlier? Whatever. Uh, I think the plan will be to try and do maybe five sessions next week, but focusing on micro head of the first paper. And once that's out of the way, we'll do some sessions on, on macro. Um, so, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the, um, on the comments coming through. Just remains for me to say thank you to Jim, producing fantastically as always, picking out some great comments and uh, making sure that the order, well, we, the order's now been cancelled, sadly, but uh, we did our best. Uh, thank you for joining in, as always. Please spread the word about our channel. Business will be kicking off with some live streams again, I think, next week, hopefully. Um, time is running short, clearly, but there's a lot we can do together as a collective ahead of these papers. And uh, so please join me next week. Uh, if, you, if you found the session useful, it's really helpful if you click like, even subscribe and the notification bell. We appreciate that. But for now, enjoy the weekend. Have a great weekend, everybody. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay curious, and see you sometime soon.